Hey everybody, here's Max tutorial number six in which we're going to introduce physics simulation. In the background today we have an artwork by my friend and former student Eric Zambrano who does wonderful uh, work that combines uh, photography and digital editing. Uh, that's Eric Zambrano. And uh, let's get right into some Max. I've made a project here and a simple main patch that has our standard starting format with a couple of small changes. Let me point them out. First of all, I've named my world Tut6 for Tutorial 6. And this allows me to have multiple simultaneous worlds going on. I could create another world in the same patch or in a patch that's also open called something else. And then objects, the first argument of any object is which world we want it to be placed into. So this adds a, a new possibility for you, which is to have multiple simultaneous worlds that contain different objects. Also, uh, please note that uh, the convention for the class is that things that are in all caps are arbitrary names given by the user. So TUT6 is in all caps because I made that up to stand for tutorial six. And the reason why the the, the word storage has always been in capital letters in the pattern storage is because this is also an arbitrary name that should change for each project. Otherwise, the JSON files that are saved and contain all the pattern storage information, um, if, they have, if, 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 the, if they have the same name for different projects, it can get very confusing. So you should put in a unique name for your pattern storage JSON file. I called it tut6 underscore, underscore storage. And as always, you want to avoid using spaces in file names in Max and in general uh, because uh, in Max in particular uh, any space is going to separate a single symbol into two symbols so if this were called pattern storage tut6 space storage it's not going to save a file called tut6 space storage.json it's going to save a file called tut6.json and the word storage here will just be an error um, an additional argument that has no meaning. So by connecting them with an underscore, I make this into a single max symbol. So how do we add physics simulation to our world? Well, let's turn on our world and see what we've got here. We've got two jit.gl.grid shapes that are assigned to the TUT6 world. Lighting is enabled and I've positioned them just left and right of center. So to turn this into a physics simulation, all I need to do is create a new object called jit.fizz.body and connect it to the object that I want to become a physical body in my physics simulation. So watch what happens as soon as I connect this, it falls to the bottom. Why? Because now gravity is acting on this object. If I do the same thing for the other one, it falls and rests on top of the other sphere. Um, and see how the jit.fizz.body overrides the position attribute. So now the physics attributes of this object control its position and also interestingly control its size. We can no longer change position or size by directly addressing the jit.gl.gridshape object. So how do we then move these objects around? Well, since they're now physical bodies, uh, in a physics simulation, we, rather than positioning them, we provide them with impulses. So I can, for instance, give the lower sphere an impulse to move in the positive x direction. And the 5 here represents the strength of the impulse. This is a message. I connect it to the jit.fizz.body, and when I send that message, watch what happens. Right, that ball, the lower ball was given an impulse to the right, so it was pushed and rolled to the right. And of course the other body then, which was resting on top of it, fell. Similarly, I could give a leftward impulse to the other sphere. Now note that they're stopping. They're resting on some kind of invisible ground and they're stopping against some sort of invisible wall. What is that? That's what we call the world box. And the world box 
is a, by default, a five meter cube in which all of the physics interactions take place. And that is something that is determined by the JIT.world. So for instance, we can change the world box scale with the message send fizz, meaning send to the physics engine, world box underscore scale, and then some new value. Let's say we want a 10 meter cube now, 10 by 10 by 10. All right, so the, so the entire message is send fizz space world box underscore scale space 10 space 10 space 10. When I send this message, watch what happens. I'll zoom my camera out a bit. This five meter physics space becomes a 10 meter physics space and the balls fall to the bottom. Now it's still an invisible space, but as we push the balls around, we can see now they're stopping in this invisible 10 by 10 by 10 cube. Um, I like to put another grid shape into my world that allows us to see that, uh, that space. So I'll create another jit.gl.grid shape. I'll make it a cube. I'll make it 10 meters on a side. I'll put it into poly underscore mode one one, so it'll be drawn as a wireframe. And now I can see my world box. And now it makes more sense. These objects are moving within the world box. So for instance, I can give this an upward impulse. And we see the ball jump within the world. I mean, I'll change the colors of these. Make that one yellow. And now we can tell which one we're dealing with. And to further clarify that, as I've shown you many times, I like to do, uh, I'll color the object itself so there's no confusion about which object I'm interacting with. I don't really have a teal there. Here I have something sort of close. making my teal ball jump, making my yellow ball jump. And the reason why they fall back down is because I'm giving them a positive Y impulse. I'm giving them an upward impulse of 10. But gravity is a constant downward force of 9.8 meters per second. And that is something that we can also adjust. But the default setting when we, uh, when we create a physics world is Earth gravity, which is a downward force of 9.8 meters per second squared, and a downward acceleration, if you will. So a couple little adjustments I'd like to make here before we move on is I'd like the ability to show and hide this world box. So I can use an attribute with the attribute enable. And this just gives me the ability to show and hide the world box, but it doesn't affect the existence of the world box. I'd also, if I change the scale of the world box, I'd like the scale of this object to change correspondingly. So I'll show you a new use of the dollar sign one, uh, the changeable argument, the dollar sign argument. We'll look at a couple different uses of that today. Um, send fizz world box scale some value, some value, some value, repeated three times. So it's always going to remain a cube. And similarly here, I can create a scale message, some value, some value, some value, and connect a floating point number box to both of these, 
which I'll probably want to exclude from my auto pattern so it's not saved into my queues. Um, and now, as I change my world box scale, interactively, this grid shape is also resized. So now I'm in a seven meter cubic world, and this grid shape that shows my world is also matching seven meters cubic. And of course, if I want one of these elements to be fixed, for instance, let's say I always want my world to be 10 meters tall, no matter how wide or deep it is, I could certainly change one of these dollar sign ones to a fixed value. And now my world is always going to be 10 meters tall because that there's no changeable argument in the message box. I like a cubic world, so I just use dollar sign one, dollar sign one, dollar sign one. And, and if you want to see how this works, you can always connect a message box and use its right inlet to see what's actually being passed to the object here. Right? When I put in seven, scale dollar sign one, dollar sign one, dollar sign one becomes scale seven, 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 which is the message that is received by the grid shape. Okay, so we can give impulses to objects and cause them to move around. So give the yellow object a rightward impulse. Give the teal object an upward impulse. We can also apply constant forces to the objects. So for instance, if I want the yellow object to continually move towards the left as if it's being blown by a wind, a constant wind, I can say force minus five zero zero and watch what happens to the yellow object. It's blown, if you will, to the left by a constant force and that force is still applied. It doesn't go away. Unlike an impulse, which I can give, but once I've given the impulse, the other forces will take over. The force, once that message is sent, it applies constantly to the object. So even though the yellow ball is currently still, it, 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 it is still meaning not moving, it has a, a constant force on it. So were I to move the teal object, we'll see the force on the yellow object take effect again. The teal object will jump up, and so the yellow object will have space to continue moving, like so. And now the objects rest on top of each other. To counteract the force, I need to send a force 000 message, and now that force has been removed from the yellow object. So now it has no, it has nothing pushing it to the left. So when it's done rolling to the right, it'll stop and stay there. If I want to reinstate that leftward force, I can click it. And if you want to be able to monitor the force on an object because it's a little hard to see, I mean, an impulse is a one-time message that the object receives, but a force, once you've sent the message, the force is always present. So you can certainly put in an attribute And the attribute will, excuse me, the attribute will display the current value of the force being applied. And as we know from attributes, they are objects that can display attributes. They're also objects that can change attributes. So if I want to change the force to five, now there's a rightward constant force of five on that object. And if I want to reset the force to zero, I can click the message and we see that's updated here in the attribute. So this gives us a very powerful new way to interact with the objects, moving them around with forces and impulses. Also, we have this constant force in our world of gravity. How do we, uh, if we, if we don't want that constant downward force to be acting on our objects, how do we counteract it? Well, we can give our objects uh, an upward force of 9.8 meters per second and then the objects will oh pardon me an upward force a positive force of 9.8 meters per second which means that our objects 
will no longer be affected by gravity. Why? Because there's a constant upward force that is counteracting the built-in downward force of the physics world. So we see we have an upward force of 9.8 meters per second and a gravity of 9.8 meters per second. So the object is now floating in space rather than falling. And of course, we can play with this as well. If we want um, a lighter than Earth gravity, we could, for instance, counteract the 9.8 meter per second gravity with a 9.0 meter upward force. And that means that uh, the object will be in approximately one tenth of Earth gravity. So it will fall, but it's going to fall much slower than, for instance, the yellow ball that's still being fully acted on by an Earth-type gravity. Uh, the other thing that's interesting um, is that by enabling the physics world, we also automatically get uh, um, an ability to interact with our objects that we haven't had before. The jit.fizz.picker object will automatically report clicks on any object in the world. So just by creating it, I go into my world and I can now drag and throw my objects around the world. And there's two modes in which they can be dragged and thrown around. And those are called the pick modes. So we'll put an attribute here. And right now we're on pick mode surface, which means when I pick up an object, I'm picking it up by the point at which I clicked it. So see how this ball is hanging from the point where the mouse is. That's because the pick mode is surface. If I change the pick mode to center, when I grab an object, I'm picking it up by its middle. So see, it's no longer hanging by the mouse point. The mouse point is representing the center of the object. So those two different uh, modes can be set globally. Also, you may just want to be able to click on an object and not drag it around. That is the dynamics attribute. With dynamics checked, I can pick up and throw objects around my world. With dynamics unchecked, I can click on objects, but I cannot drag them and throw them. So what's the purpose of that? Well, the purpose of that is to create uh, the ability to interact with objects. So if we, take a, if we put a message box here um, and use the left outlet of picker to the right inlet of message box, when I click on an object, I get this message, mouse, meaning a mouse event has happened, space the object's name, and this is an auto-generated name. We can change this. And then whether the mouse is, the mouse button is down, which reports a one, or the mouse button is up, which reports a zero. And these are, these are discrete messages, meaning this is sent once. They're edge events, as we've talked about before in tutorials. Once when the mouse button is clicked, and again when the mouse button is released. So if we put a, if we put a button here just to show events, there's an event when I click, and there's an event when I release. Uh, hmm, that's interesting. This may be, this may in fact be a continuous continuous message. Let's put a counter on it and see. Oh, that's interesting. Yes, it reports every frame while the mouse button is down. So, ah, so the mouse up is a discrete message, but the mouse down is a continuous message. So this is interesting because it also will tell me the amount of time that I've clicked on an object. I didn't know that before. That's a very useful, uh, very useful thing. So uh, this means that if I reset this counter to zero, which I can do in the middle inlet, when I click, it's going to report how many frames I've had the mouse button down. So now I've had it down for 400 frames. And when I release, we see I held that mouse button down for 421 frames. Ah, that's an interesting feature that I wasn't 
aware of. So what can we do with these messages? Well, first of all, this is obviously not a human readable name that Max assigned to the object. Um, it's actually not the name of the object, I should say. It's the name of the physics body. So we can put the name attribute in here at name. Um, and which one is this? This one is yellow. So we say at name yellow. And notice I'm putting that in all capital letters to indicate that that is my name for the object that I made up. I could have called it Fred. And this one, I'll say at name teal. So now when I click on them, watch what happens. I click on it and it says mouse teal one or mouse teal zero, mouse yellow one, mouse yellow zero. So now the, the, the Max patch knows, is aware of which object I'm clicking on by the name that I gave it, and that makes life much easier. So that leads us to the need for a new object. How do we, how do we get this message apart so that we can deal with uh, the interactive information we're receiving? Well, the, new, the first new object we're going to look at is the route object. And what route does, rest, route is a message processing object. Um, the first actually, the first one I need is route mouse. So what route mouse does is it looks at messages, and if they begin with the word mouse, it takes the word mouse off and passes the rest of the message on. So when I click, mouse teal one or mouse teal zero becomes just teal zero. In other words, the word mouse was identified by route and sliced off. So that's very useful <clears throat> because this word mouse actually doesn't give us any additional information because either object that we click on is being clicked on by the mouse. So that, that word mouse can just be sliced off and gotten rid of. That's what we're using the route object for in this case. With a second route object, we can now evaluate the new first word, which is either going to be yellow or teal. So now, when I click on the yellow ball, I either get a one or a zero, right? Because I've routed off the word mouse and I've routed off the word yellow. But I haven't routed off the word teal, so nothing is passed through the left out the left inlet of the route when I click on the teal. So route can take multiple arguments. I can have a route yellow space teal. And watch this, this is gonna create a middle outlet of my route that says route outputs if input matches teal. So now I have a monitor for clicks on my yellow object and a monitor for clicks on my teal object. When I click on yellow, this message box will change. When I click on teal, this message box will change. There's yellow, there's teal. This is functionally identical to using two route messages if that's easier for you to understand. So this is functionally identical. On the left I have my yellow report, on the right I have my teal report. Also, because the right outlet of route is a reject outlet, just like uh, the right outlet of select is a reject outlet, this is also functionally equivalent. There's my yellow report, there's my teal report. But the most compact way to do it is just to use, to put in two arguments to the same route. And you can put a bunch of arguments into route and it'll just keep creating new outlets. So what do we do with this information once we have it? Well, we can do anything we want. Um, so for instance, We can, for instance, have the shape of the object change when it's clicked. So when we click on the yellow object, we'll select one for the mouse down event. And we can also select zero for the mouse up event. And these are gonna send bangs or button presses. So we can, for instance, use the shape cube message. And now here's the interesting thing about shapes. We need to change the shape not just of the grid shape, 
but also of its physics body because the uh, the physics body and the object itself can have different shapes which is something you can play with and it's interesting but in general so that your the physics behavior of your objects matches their appearance you want to change both the shape of the physics body and the grid shape so now when I click on the yellow ball it becomes a cube similarly I could do something on the mouse up event change it back to a sphere on mouse up so when I click it it becomes a cube when I release the mouse it becomes a sphere again and I have dynamics off so I can't actually drag the object now of course this is getting messy in terms of our patch cords so we want to start putting sends and receives I'll receive YP meaning yellow physics and I'll receive YG meaning yellow grid shape and then I can send to both of these. So now I'm changing both the physics body and the grid shape. Through wireless connections. Cube, sphere. And for instance, if I also want to change the size, that I would only need to send to the physics body. So I could say scale 222. Two, two. When I click the button, it becomes a cube and scales up. But since I didn't send it a scale 111 message, it's not going to return. Let's make this a little bit clearer. It's not going to return to a scale of 111. So if I wanted the scale to release, to change back, when I release the mouse button, I could send the scale 111 message. And now it's small as a sphere, large as a cube, small as a sphere, large as a cube. Uh, so any kind of interactivity um, can be achieved here. So if this were our yellow interaction, we could take this and just to make things less medi messy, we could encapsulate it. And of course, that's my own name for the encapsulated subpatcher we can now see here. And then do something else with the teal. For instance, uh, give it some sort of impulse. Uh, cell is uh, shorthand for select. Cell 1 and select 1 are the same thing. Select 1. Uh, so let's give our teal an upward impulse when we click it. And of course, we can change things that are unrelated to the physics body, body themselves. For instance, we could um, have a sound play when we click on an object. We'll use the live.gain object to control our volume. And as per usual, the EasyDAC object for sound output. And as always, it's two channels because it's stereo, one for the left ear, one for the right ear. Our sound is on. And let's just preview our sound. That's cool. And we can uh, trigger this playlist using... Um, using the number one. So 
this seems a bit odd. We're doing a select one to a message box containing one, but it'll work. If we click on the teal ball, the select one will be true. It'll bang the one, which will play the sound when we click on teal. Ah, and we're hearing multiple triggers there because the, the continuous output. So we also need our friend from previous tutorial change. which only will output the number if it changes. And that's going to give us a single clean hit. Uh, let me see. Anything else there? We've got the ability to change shape and size, the ability to create impulses, and of course, we could certainly also change the color, which we would send to the grid shape itself. And we're getting a little bit of a non-responsiveness because of the change object, because uh, when I'm releasing the mouse, I'm releasing it not over the ball itself. So I actually need to click it. Uh, that time it worked. But sometimes I need to click it again for this change to take effect. And we'd need to do a little bit more work to debug that. It should work perfectly with an object that's not moving but it may require a little bit more work to have it work fluidly with an object that moves out from under our mouse before we release the mouse button. Uh, and uh, we don't really have space to get into that in this tutorial. So I'll leave that as a challenge for you to solve if you're in that situation. Uh, and again, we can certainly use sends and receives here, and it's. Uh, teal physics, receive teal physics, receive teal grid shape, and of course the corresponding send teal physics, send teal grid shape, and of course the impulse is going to physics, whereas the color is going to grid shape. And of course, as things get messy like this, encapsulation very much becomes our friend. We can take this entire structure here and edit, encapsulate, we'll call it. or whatever you want to call it, so that it's descriptive for you. Um, also, just as one other note, in terms of my slightly obsessive color coding, I would put all of these to teal and all of these to yellow. And then within my patchers, make the same change for visual clarity within the patch. And of course, the teal is <clears throat> now red, but that's easy enough to change back. Or maybe we don't want to identify these by color. If color is something we're going to be changing, we might want to name it in a different way. Uh, 
Hmm, here's our problem again, right? It's not, it's gonna change to red. Oh, it, it changes back, but sometimes it misses. Hmm, but most of the time it works. Uh, so there might be, might be something where a little bit of additional, a little bit of additional uh, processing of the click information is required. But again, that's outside of the scope of this tutorial. Although one thing I will, I will add, um, because we haven't talked about it and it's interesting and useful, is things that happen at a at a time delay. Um, so, for instance, if we want the teal to automatically uh, to, to to turn red, and then let's say after a second, automatically turn uh, back to teal, we can use a new object. Now let's quickly introduce this called delay, which is going to delay and delay only delays a bang. It only delays a button press by milliseconds. So delay 1000 will mean one second after we click the button, this thing will happen. So watch this. I click it and then one second later, it turns to teal. That's because of this delay 1000. It delays this button press, it delays this bang by one second, and then sends the color. And that's a, that's a very useful, a very useful tool to have. Um, it's also certainly useful for sound. Um, we can have a second sound here, for instance. And of course, we can mix sounds together just by sending them to the same inlet. And this second sound will come one second after the first sound. Oh, that's fun. Especially because the color change and the, and the sounder are coordinated. Um, all right, so there's just one more thing I want to look at in this tutorial, which is how to take this into a poly context. And I've created a very simple poly here um, that just has two inlets, one to my uh, jit.fizz.body and one to my grid shape. And see, uh, even within the poly, I've specified tut6 as the world that this object is being rendered to. So if I want 50 cubes in my world, I just say poly tilde. Uh, the name of my poly is just poly, and 50. And now, boom, 50 cubes have just appeared in my in my world. I'm going to turn this off for a moment. I'm just turning off of the, the grid shape that shows my world box. And this works the same as polys as we've been dealing with them so far. Meaning, I can, if I want to do something to all of them, I can say target zero gl color one 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 one, which is going to make them all turn white. Boom, they're all white. Similarly, my in two gives me access to uh, the physics engine, the jit.phys.body, so I can say target zero impulse. 0, 10, 0, which is going to give them all an upward impulse. Boom. Um, and also, we didn't talk about this, but uh, torque impulse will also impart a spin. So, tor, T O R Q U E underscore I M P U L S E, torque impulse is going to uh, spin them along an axis of my choosing. So, I can spin them, for instance, along the x axis. As I torque them, as I uh, I can I can as as they get the upward impulse, they also get a torque, a spin along the x-axis, and now they're tumbling. And of course, as always, I can individually address objects using the same formula we've worked with, worked with before. I've got fifty objects, so I could do an Uzi fifty. Target dollar 
cosine 1 using the counter outlet of the Uzi. And then, for instance, uh, give them a random impulse. Uh, I'll say random 100. Scale 0 to 99, uh, 0 to 10. So 100 possible values between 0 and 10. And use that as an upward force randomly applied to the objects. So now each object is going to get a random upward force. No, it's not. Why not? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, there, <laughs> just delayed reaction. Ah, interesting. Uh, the reason why is because gravity is still acting. Um, so let's take a look at how to globally turn off gravity. That's a good moment to do that. Uh, we will do to our world a send fizz gravity zero 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 and this is gonna make our whole world lose gravity and now we can see all the forces taking effect Zero, meaning all objects force zero 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 it's going to turn off the force on all objects and there's no gravity so they just stay where they are but if we turn gravity back on we'll see them fall send fizz gravity negative 9.8 is going to restore us to normal earth gravity and the objects fall. Mm, except for a couple. That's interesting. Target zero four zero zero zero. I'm not sure why these guys are still hovering up there. That's interesting. I'm not going to take time to debug that right now because we're 40 minutes into this tutorial. Um, and uh, so I leave that as a challenge to you if you can figure out why those few objects got stuck up there. Uh, great, good for you, and let me know and post it in the comments. Um, I am not sure off the top of my head. Uh, so the one final piece that I'd like to cover is uh, we have our jit.fizz.picker and all of these objects are included, but we don't want to have to go through, and in fact, we can't go through and name them all by hand because they're in a poly context. So how do we deal with if I want something to happen when I click on these individual objects? And this is a bit advanced, so really, if you feel like you've got enough to start with, uh, then go ahead and start with that. And then at the very end of the tutorial, I'm gonna add a little section to talk about how to deal with objects when we're not able to specifically rename them things like yellow and teal. Uh, how do we deal with an arbitrary number of objects? Before I do that, I just want to show you very briefly a few more uh, attributes that apply to the jit.fizz.body. And these are copied directly out of the help file mass, restitution, friction, and damping. Uh, so if you option click your jit.fizz.body, it will open up the interactive help patch here, and you can see a lot of the different attributes that apply to jit.fizz.bodies. And of course, as always, you can open up the reference to get the full, full rundown on all of the features of the objects in the reference file, which will give you a ton of information. 
So it's the interaction of mass, restitution, friction, and damping that create the particular qualities that the objects have in the physical world. So we can see the default values here are a mass of 1, restitution of 0.1, friction of 0.5, and a linear and angular damping of 0.2. So when I give my teal uh, sphere an upward impulse, when it falls, is it going to bounce? Is it going to rest? What's going to happen? Well, it's an interaction of these values uh, to see exactly how it's going to respond. Uh, and there needs to be another physical object that it's interacting with. Right now, it's coming to rest against the uh, against the uh, world box, which is not going to allow for a physics interaction. So let's create a new uh, grid shape. That is. Uh, A, uh, a plane, and we're going to lay that plane uh, I apologize, scale needs, scale is now an attribute of the fizz body So now we have this, this plane. And it's not quite resting at the bottom of our world because it's fallen on top of all of these other objects. But we can simply reinstantiate those objects so that the plane is at the bottom of our world. So there's the plane, the cubes are on top of it. Now the, the, the balls are underneath. We'll just reinstantiate the balls so they appear on top of it. And now the plane is at the bottom, and the balls are on top of it. And so this plane on the bottom is, is now a physics body right here. Um, and I will remove the color coding so it's clear that that's something different. And now, when we bounce the teal ball, we see it makes an impact when it lands. And so if we reduce its mass and increase its restitution, it's going to become bouncier. See a little bit of a bounce to it. And then if we reduce its linear damping, it's going to become even bouncier. And if we reduce its friction, it's going to become bouncier and more likely to roll around, and of course if we make the impulse it's receiving a bit more complicated, it's going to interact in a more interesting way with the environment. So you can play with all of these factors. How massive is your object? What's the restitution or sort of residual force in the object? Uh, how much friction is applied as it moves across surfaces? How much linear energy is damped? Um, when it collides with another object, how much angular or rotational energy is damped when it collides with another object. And these factors are all going to combine to make your, uh, to, to give your objects exactly the physical properties that you want them to have in space. And it's 
quite fun to just play with. Uh, all right, so as a last factor here, um, hopefully can finish this before we get to the hour mark. I just want to add this extra piece about how to uh, make these individual arbitrarily named objects responsive to our interactive clicks. Um, and to do that, we need to start inside the poly, which is here. So I'm going to go inside, to the poly, inside of the poly and unlock the poly, add a load bang. And we're going to use the load bang to send the get name message to our jit.fizz.body. So as soon as the patch loads, this body is going to report its name. Its name in this case is u47002391. Uh, we're going to use our new discovery uh, today, the route object, to strip off the word name so that now we get just the object's name. And then a new feature of the receive object is we can interactively set the name of the receive object. So we can say receive with no argument. Up till now, we've been using receive with a typed in argument. If we use receive with no argument, we can then uh, set the receive name. So uh, another new object is prepend which simply means to put before. So we're taking off the word name and we're adding the word set. So now our object name comes out of the object and gets the word set put before it. And so when set gets sent to the receive object, it's now setting the, the name of the receive. So this is now a receive u47002391 in the same way that this is a receive yg. And we can send this to, for instance, the grid shape. I don't like that patch cord. I like a curvy patch cord there. Um, let me just briefly check on one detail. OK, that all looks correct. So I'm going to save my poly. And now each one of these cubes can receive by name information. So when I click on it, we see we get the message mouse, and then the object name, and then the one or the zero. So that is going to fall out the right outlet of our route, because it's neither yellow or teal. When I click on it, same, I get the object name and the click state. These are unfortunately in the wrong order for us to use. So we're going to, here's the other, I was telling you there's another use of the dollar sign argument. Um, when you have a message that's in the wrong order, where the thing that you want on the, on the left, which is that the restitution we added is causing the whole space to sort of quiver. That's interesting. Um, I could make my, I can make my floor. more massive, and that should cause less bounce. Oh, and I can also increase the, I can increase the uh, linear damping of my floor. Right, and that's going to reduce some of that bounce that's happening in my world. Uh, so heading back to this. Uh, so when, when messages are in the wrong order, right, it's name and then click state. I actually want them in click state followed by name. You can use this in a message box, dollar sign two, dollar sign one. What this says is it says swap the first two elements of the incoming list, right? So instead of name click state, it flips them around to click state name. And we can take a look and see that this is true again by using that magical right inlet of the message box. Right, now I have click state followed by name. Why did I want click state followed by name? Because of right to leftness in Max. Uh, here's another new object, 
unpack, which takes a list and separates it out into its components. Our click state is an integer, and our name is a symbol. So unpack is is going to give me click state here, object name here. Excellent, just what I want. And then uh, another new object, which is the forward object. And the forward object is a send object where you can change the name uh, that's being sent to. And with that, we use uh, prepend prepend send into the forward object. So the message here becomes when I click on an object, we send to that object's name. And since we've already created a receive of the same name on the other end, we're talking directly to the object being clicked. Uh, and now we add whatever interactivity it is we want. When, the, when that object is clicked, we'll just do something simple like it turns red. GL color 1001. And that's the message that gets forwarded to our object. So I click, and every time I click an object, that specific object becomes red and no others. Excellent. Uh, let me see. We have about three minutes left before we hit the hour mark. So I just want to step through this last piece one more time for those of you who are interested. Um, what's going on here is route mouse strips off the word mouse. Route yellow teal separates out messages that are specifically from the yellow and the teal balls. All the other messages pass through this dollar sign two dollar sign one which flip-flops the order of the information instead of name click state it's now click state name unpack is a new object that separates out that two element list into the click state which is an integer and the name which is a symbol prepend send puts the word send before the symbol passes it onto the forward object so this forward temporarily becomes a send object name object and then the click state uh, is processed in whatever way we want. In this case, we're looking for a mouse down event. When we see a mouse down event, it causes the color to be set to red on the currently selected object. And on the receiving end of this, inside the poly tilde, what we've got is we've got a load bang that gets the name of our physics body, strips off the word name because we don't need it, replaces it with the word set, which is then passed to the receive object and it sets the receive, jump, receive object to become a receive object name object as opposed to a typed in receive like receive YP. It's now receive U98345 or whatever the object name is and we're passing that receive directly to the grid shape. Of course, you could be passing it to the jit.fizz.body if you wanted to. Um, and if you really wanted to get deeper into this, you could do a little bit more message processing so you could send messages either to the jit.fizz.body or to the jit.gl.gridshape within the poly tilde. And that brings us up to the hour mark. Um, so I hope that this has been interesting or, uh, or and useful for you. Please feel free to email me with questions or post questions to the YouTube channel. And for my students, um, please dig into this. Uh, and we're going to use this information extensively uh, in the class final project. Thanks very much. Take good care. Bye-bye.